Eve is real. That single statement has embroiled the Eve Online community in disagreement for years. That sentence sums up everything that makes Eve special. And every player has an opinion on it. For some people, the notion that Eve is real is absurd. A way of placing false importance on the silly spaceship game, and a byproduct of people taking the game too seriously. For others, the idea is more meaningful. For them, for us, it's very much a philosophical statement. For us, it's about expanding the definition of what constitutes a real space. The building blocks of EVE Online's universe, called New Eden, are ones and zeros rather than ordinary Earth elements. But what Earth and New Eden have in common is humanity, Jealousy, ambition, revenge and greed, hatred and friendship are at the core of EVE Online. Human emotions and work make up the soul of New Eden, and you'll find every emotion there that you would in the traditional world. In that sense, New Eden is very much a new province of humanity, and its history is worth preserving. It's a place where a single leader can inspire dozens of Russian pilots to defend their last star base for two and a half days straight, without sleep. It's a place where ide ideological differences can spark years-long conflict involving tens of thousands of real humans. The full range of human potential is on display in Eve. It's a virtual space, but it's a virtual space where causation and human ambition matter. And that makes it a space that matters to history. As a journalist, chroni chronicling the history of EVE Online is an incredibly exciting opportunity. Scholars have been studying the actions of players in virtual worlds for decades, but never before, to the best of my knowledge, has anyone worked to document the stories and the struggles of the people who inhabit one of these virtual places. There are certainly many people who think spending your time in a virtual world is a waste of energy, but I hope to convince you in these pages that it's not. The stories from Eve are no different from those that occur in the real world. They inspire and bring meaning to people's lives, and they show us the very best and worst in ourselves. Eve is real. Andrew Gowen the following is based on true events. Chapter 1 The War for Inn's Mother and the Siege of SeaTac J6MT On May 25, 2006, 70 Russian pilots sat tired and bleary eyed in their battleships near the first moon of the fourth planet in a star system so remote it was known only by the obscure, obscure designation 6. Attack J6MT. They had dug in their heels, huddled around their last stronghold, a defensive star base, and they were prepared for the fight of their lives. Their fleet commander, a Russian born New Yorker known to his compatriot as Death, spoke to his friends and fellow pilots, rallying the troops for one last stand. You have to be able to show people that there is a hope. He later said, even a fucking tiny one, just show the people that there is a little tiny hope that exists. A fleet of over 400 coalition of the South ships, the enemies of the Russians, warped in on the position of the 70 defenders. Among the massive fleet were 15 state-of-the-art, siege-capable dreadnoughts, designed to rip the entrenched Russian positions to shreds. As the coalition dreadnoughts aimed their huge guns at the starbase and fired the opening volley, the Russian fleet commander gave the order to retaliate. They were outnumbered, almost six to one, but they were prepared. 
When you're going up against those kind of odds, you are better have some great fucking idea about how you're going to beat their asses. Death told me in a thick Russian accent. The siege of Tac J had begun. The Russian pilots were all that remained of the former powerhouse Red Alliance. A group whose holdings had once spanned across 450 systems making it the dominant power in the southeast of New Eden. The coalition of the south was comprised of several smaller alliances, which each had an ancestral claim to the territory of Red Alliance conquered. Some very old groups in EVE occasionally claim ancestral rights to certain territories, if they were among the first to settle there when the game launched in 2003. Before they joined forces and became the coalition of the south, the smaller groups each individually asked Red Alliance for their territory back, but each request was denied by Red Alliance at the height of its power and its hubris. Real-world relationships can heavily influence politics in EVE, and in this case, the path to a peaceful resolution was being obstructed because some coalition of the South pilots thought it was funny to mock the Russians for their nationality. They really bore grudges, the Russians, said Lalante, a former fleet commander in the Coalition of the South. We tried diplomacy initially to say we're happy leaving you in the East. You can keep your old regions, let's just be friends. And then they replied, no, we remember, we remember all those vodka jokes. This is gonna go down. Not content to take no for an answer, those alliances came together to remove Red Alliance from its enormous empire in the southeast. Individually, the alliances that made up the coalition of the south were no match for the Russians, but as a combined unit it was a dominant force in the southeast of New Eden, and so the fingers, Lotka Volterra, Knights of the Sardin Cross, Chimera Pact and Veritas Immortalis formed the fist. The Coalition of the South, its ranks number in the thousands. It was wealthy, and it was capable of fielding fleets bigger and better equipping than any of the regions. The ranks of Red Alliance had swelled too. The Russian Alliance now recruited American and French wings among other nationalities. As Red Alliance accepted more and more partner groups into its alliance, the Coalition of the South prepared for a massive invasion of Red Alliance territory. And then, the stage was set for an epic war between two giants of the Southeast. But it didn't pan out that way. The initial invasion of Red Alliance territory went unopposed. Two whole regions, 180 star systems, they were lost for the most mundane of reasons. Red Alliance's leadership couldn't convince its pilots to make the long trip out for the battle from their headquarters. The region of Detorid and Imencia were lost, and Red Alliance defense fleets were nowhere to be found. The newfound girth of Red Alliance was working against it. In the words of a former leader, Master, a Russian word both pronounced and meaning master, but it's spelled M-A-C-T-E-P. It had too many languages barriers and was weakly organized. There are two terrible qualities for an organization trying to fill an army in EVE online. Loyalty takes time to develop, and Red Alliance's constituent corporations were li like newly absorbed independent states still more loyal to themselves than to the Alliance as a whole. Beyond that, it's difficult to form camaraderie between soldiers who speak different languages, and it's also difficult to ask new Alliance members to spend their time and risk their ships to defend territory they played no role in conquering in the first place. Not to mention the difficulty of leading a fleet under the guiding voice of a single commander, when many of your pilots don't even speak the commander's language. In the region of Wicked Creek, Red Alliance finally stood its ground and mounted a defense on March 8, 2006. 
It fielded its largest capital ships, Dreadnoughts, and made a stand. Dreadnoughts are extremely powerful, yet vulnerable warships. They had the ability to go into siege mode, which gave them a huge bonuses to firepower and servability, but this also rendered them immobile for 10 long minutes. This later was reduced by the game's developer to 5 minutes. They could output enormous amounts of damage in siege mode, but if the battle went south, then these expensive ships had no way to extract or receive help from repair ships. The Battle of Wicked Creek began, and Red Alliance's loss were catastrophic. Nine of Red Alliance's prized dreadnoughts, the most expensive ship in existence at the time, were destroyed, and its morale was broken. After this crushing defeat, the Alliance fell to pieces. Because Red Alliance was composed of loosely joined corporations, its pilots and fleet commanders were only experienced in small fleet combat. No one was yet capable of leading the hundreds of ships necessary to mount an effective defense with expensive capital ships, and so the Red Pilots were defeated again and again. The writing was on the wall. The Coalition of the South Time was rising and the sun had set on Red Alliance. One by one, the corporation which once happily joined Red Alliance began making excuses and leaving the front. The Alliance's last few dozen members were left to fend for to fend for themselves. Every non-Russian corporation in Red Alliance gave up the fight, leaving only a small squad of, of pilots to carry on the Red name. What was left was a ragged group of just under a hundred players, many of whom weren't actually even fighters. Some of them were what Red Alliance called its citizens, non-combatant civilians who depend on the military for protection but the miners of Red Alliance weren't merely vulnerable civilians. They had been under constant attack for months, fending off coalition of the South raids into their own territory. As a result, they had no choice but to figure out how to protect themselves. This meant becoming schooled in the dark art of player versus player combat. They became a mobilized civilian militia, the rest of Red Alliance's pilots were among the best fighters in the game at that point. Pushed out of their territory, they opt to stay behind enemy lines rather than flee. Many of them stayed inside enemy systems for weeks, hiding in safe spots where the enemy had trouble finding them. They'd become the meanest, most ruthless pilots in New Eden. They stayed hidden until the enemy dropped its guard then swooped down like hawks to pick up vulnerable lone enemies. There was no surrender. But all of this leaves the questions. Why were these Russian pilots sticking it out to the bitter end against terrible odds? What could they possibly hope to accomplish? The answer has much to do with the international multilingual structure of EVE Online. There are groups in E from dozens of countries, and people generally prefer to play with others who understand their culture and their language. In 2006, there was only one major Russian player group, Red Alliance. So for Red Alliance pilots to abandon their comrades would be tantamount to abandoning any sort of social structures in EVE, and likely abandoning EVE itself. Games like EVE aren't much fun when you're playing solo. Another factor they wanted revenge. They were utterly fixated on sticking it to the Coalition of the South, which had conquered their hard-won territory. When you're at the point where you're losing your real-life job because you're trying to achieve something, you have to keep going, said Mikhail Romachenko, better known today as Death because otherwise all of those losses were for nothing. When you set a goal for yourself, you have to achieve it, no matter what. But it was also about, about more than just stubbornness. Many members of the Coalition of the South were not exactly gracious in victory. 
Some members of their coalition could be found spouting nationalist, even racial epithets and hate speech about the Russians. Russian dogs, they're selling isk to feed their families, their ships were bought with Russian brides, and so on. The intent was to disparage the Russian players and make them lose all joy for the game and quit. It had the opposite effect. It gave the Russian players a relying cry, and a reason to fight. Victory in EVE is very often accomplished with one side simply gives up and moves on or falls apart from internal strife. In this case, the, oppos the opposite was happening and the Russian players weren't going to be booted out of Nullsec until they lost every ship they had. The Red Invasion from Red Alliance waged a guerrilla. They waged a guerrilla war against the new lords of the land. Under the leadership of fleet commanders Studek, Death and Master, small groups of 20 to 30 Red Alliance pilots would venture out into enemy territory to hunt. Bizarrely, they were ignored for days, even weeks as they stalked and destroyed their enemies. The Coalition of the South had been broadcasting propaganda about the demise of Red Alliance and this led most people to believe that any Red Alliance members they saw were stragglers and nothing to be feared. They were wrong. These Red Alliance raiding gangs quickly wrapped up a kill tally of over 500 ships on their hunts and lost only a tenth as many in the return. But Red Alliance wasn't going to defeat a coalition of thousands with hit and run tactics. It needed to win battles. The raiding gangs had been a nuisance, but now it was time for a real offensive. Red Alliance selected one system as the key to its traditional home region of Innsmother, SeaTac J 6MT. It was centrally located in Innsmother, contained valuable space station, and was the gateway to eight other star systems. On May 24, 20, 20, <clears throat> On May 24, 2006, Red Alliance attacked and took 6 Stack J, and it took it away from the coalition. It quickly built defenses, preparing to defend the system at any cost. The coalition could never have stopped the surprise attack, but it certainly planned to take the system back. The war for Inn's mother on May 25th, those 70 exhausted R Russian pilots were grouped up around their defensive starbase waiting for the battle they knew was coming. A fleet of over 400 coalition of the South ship warped into the system and began organizing for battle. For the coalition of the South, this was a chance to stomp out the flame of Red Alliance. It had defeated the Red weeks before, weeks ago and believed exterminating it here was key to stopping future attacks. When the coalition pilots arrived, they were full of bluster. Many of them were still spouting the same old Russian epithets in the local chat channel. Every major battle had gone their way after all. They believed victory was a foregone conclusion. The coalition of the South Fleet was massive but weakly organized. It showed up with hundreds of ships of all makes and models with very little in the way of true strategy. The Russians, on the other hand, were extremely well organized and knew exactly what they planned to do. After months of guerrilla warfare, they were a finely tuned fighting force. Every pilot in the Red Alliance was outfitted with this exact same ship, a mid-sized Tempest-class battleship, with the exact same components, the intent being that every pilot would be on the same page as every other pilot at all times. They flew in packs of 10. The Coalition of the South dreadnoughts unpacked their heavy artillery and unloaded on the defensive starbase while Red Alliance pilots charged the enemy lines. In their small packs, they swarmed the coalition dreadnoughts like wasps, difficult to hit and packing a punch. The damage they were doing to the dreadnoughts forced the rest of the coalition to try to defend them. Rather than destroying Red Alliance's defensive starbase, the coalition was now on its back foot just trying to keep its own valuable ship from being destroyed. 
while the Red Alliance Tempest formation swarmed the enemy dreadnoughts, the defensive Starbase's automated guns were annihilating the Coalition's smaller battleships. One by one, they were popping like fireworks, as a Starbase skill tally steadily rose. The packs of Red Alliance Tempest wove through the enemy fleet with near impunity, with each group of 10 ships coordinating attacks on one specific enemy. The damage to the seven groups of battleships were inflicting began to rise higher and higher. The coalition fleet was simply outmatched, not in numbers or in firepower, but in strategy. When the smoke cleared, the coalition found itself down hundreds of ships, while the Red Alliance defensive base was still standing and fully repaired. Red Alliance gave the Starbase a name in honor of its stunning performance in the first battle. The Meat Grinder. One day later, the Coalition returned, but was again turned back in a near repeat of the previous day's siege. Red Alliance took bigger losses this time, but again made the Coalition hurt much more badly. Crucially, Red Alliance managed to take down the flagship dreadnought of the Coalition of the South Fleet Commander, which was named Chow Down, a symbolic blow that took the wind out of the Coalition's sails and embarrassed its leader. The next day, the third of the siege, the Coalition's pilot arrived in low spirits. At this point, what hope could they have had in removing the Russian fleet if they'd already failed with two previous waves of attacks? But Coalition commanders hoped they could win by grinding down the Russians. Even if, it's lo even if it lost these battles, the Coalition had four regions full of hundreds of miners and workers to replace its ships. Red Alliance didn't have that luxury. Every ship was priceless. And so again we fought, said one of the Coalition's fleet commanders, Lolente. We brought the full weight of four alliances to bear on this one system where they were holed up, but they kept staying up all night to defend and coming up with brilliant strategies to kill our dreadnoughts, he said. Predictably, the third day was a disaster for the Coalition of the South. Red Alliance destroyed four more Coalition dreadnoughts and once again pushed back its enemies. Morale had hit rock bottom in the Coalition of the South. But Red Alliance hadn't beaten the Coalition yet. It had merely stood its ground. The Reds were sturdy enough to hold against a foe trying to push them out. But they were a long way from taking back the hundreds of systems lost in the initial assault. In the following days, there were no big engagement, but the Coalition still maintained a presence inside 6 Stack J. At all times, it outnumbered Red Alliance 2-1, instead Red Alliance's own system. The Russians were patient. The Coalition was blockading Red Alliance in the system, but it was getting tired. Day after day, Coalition forces inside 6 Stack J weakened until finally its numbers were equal to Red Alliance. The Russians saw their advantage. They attacked and wiped out the Coalition blockade, removing any dispute as to the true owners of 6 Stack J. After months of fighting and a week's long siege, Red Alliance had forced a stalemate and stopped the retreat. Six Stack J had been conquered by an alliance with more grit and determination than has been seen before or even after. But to take the rest of Inn's mother and regain the southeast, Red Alliance would need allies. Fortunately for the Russians, within days they would find the most powerful ally they could possibly imagine. And that was the beginning. The Siege of Six Stack J is just one story in the vast interstellar drama that is EVE Online. It's merely an excerpt plucked out of context from the much grander story of the game that this book explores. In order to understand these recurring characters and these warring nations, we have to go back to their origin, at the dawn of the game in 2003. But before we can explore the events and sweeping narrative of the, the Outer Rim of EVE Online, including the ramification of this legendary Russian stand at 6 Stack J, there are some things you'll need to know about the game. 
Chapter 2 An Introduction to EVE Online It's Wednesday night in Belgrade, and a young man is logged in to EVE Online, an online science fiction video game. Along with 49,387 players from around the world who are exploring the quiet, dark of the roughly 7,500 star systems that make up the new Eden star cluster. In one of those systems, the young man from Belgrade, new to the game, is orbiting a small asteroid. He is flying a Venture class beginner mining ship to prospect for ore in low security space. In the Tamil star system in the region of Lone Trek, he burns through an asteroid with lasers, like blowtorches and collects the scordite ore into the ship's cargo hold, while nervous nervously watching for any signs of inbound pirates. As soon as his cargo hold is full, he warps his ship to the system's stargate and sets up a nuttle pilot course for the Jeta system, the nearest major trade hub, where players meet to buy and sell goods. He'll be able to unload the score die or quickly there. He won't make a fortune, but it'll be enough to start saving for a larger mining ship. When the miner arrives at the main station in Jeta, he puts the score die or up for sale in the marketplace and heads back out to do some more mining. Before long, that ore is snapped up by another player who works as a, as a production specialist. She makes a living by buying cheap ores on the market and processing them. And she processes them in the refinery into their more valuable constituent parts, crystal-like minerals called pyrite and tritanium. In turn, she sells them at a profit to a wealthy player who is buying up these minerals en masse as an investment. He has his finger on the pulse of New Eden's politics, and he has learned that two enormous player groups, each with more than 10,000 players from the Nullsec regions of space, are about to go to war against one another. And when they do, thousands of ships will be destroyed in the Calamity, and their miners will no longer be safe enough to collect ores for building replacements. The investor is gambling that those player groups will come to Jita to replenish their supplies, causing a surge in demand that will send the price of these minerals through the roof. When these player alliances scoop up the refined pyrite and tritanium minerals, they pour them into construction of a brand new Titan-class ship. This enormous vessel requires the coordination of hundreds of players to haul millions of tons of minerals to massive capital shipyards. It can only be built by extremely well-organized groups of players and still takes between two and three months to construct. But when it's done, it will be a force unlike anything else in EVE Online. Titans are so rare that most average players can spend years playing even never even see one. The warring alliances are constructing entire fleets of these behemoths. The ores that the lonely miner harvested will now become part of the doomsday cannon of an avatar class titan, which will someday soon obliterate an entire dreadnought class siege ship with a single volley that small hull of ore harvested by a single miner is about to become, become part of an interstellar conflict for power and glory between tens and thousands of, pe of real people. On Thursday, 26 hours later, it's nearly midnight of, in Belgrade and that lonely miner is back out in an asteroid belt in the Tamo system in Lone Trek. Stuffing the cargo hold with Scordite again, he stayed up later than usual to make some extra money, and he's crossing paths with other players he doesn't normally encounter. Tonight, his worst fear comes true, when he notices a new ship on his overview coming directly at him. A pirate. Moments later, he's struck by a laser blast and warp scrambled so he can't get away. The pirate opens up a chat line to the miner and offers him a chance to escape with his cargo intact. 
if he pays a ransom. But the miner is new to the game and doesn't have enough money on hand to pay for the Rex de extortion. So the pirate blasts his ship into oblivion. As the ship bursts into flames, it automatically launches an escape pod with the miner from Belgrade inside. Normally, this would allow the miner to get away, but the pirate is angry that her ransom was refused, so she destroys the escape pod out of spite. The miner's body is destroyed, and his consciousness instantly awakens inside a clone in another star system, as all pilots do when they're killed in EVE Online. Furious that this pirate destroyed an entire evening's worth of mining yield, the miner contacts of a rich friend who has been playing Eve a much longer time to ask her for a loan, and she agrees. The miner gets a new ship, flies back to Jita, and opens the community chat channel. Over a thousand players are in Jita right now, and the system-wide channel is buzzing with hucksters, alliance recruiters, scam artists, and a few legitimate business people advertising their wares. The miner asks for help contracting reputable bounty hunters. He's put in touch with a mercenary player group called Double Tap, which agrees on a fair price to hunt down and kill the pirate who destroyed his ship. The miner agrees to pay half in advance and half when he receives the pirate's corpse. Before the night is over, the mercenaries return with the pirate's body frozen from being jettisoned into the vacuum of space when their escape pod was destroyed and close out the contract. Friday, the next evening, 2,000 kilometers away in Moscow, the leader of a group of mostly Russian pilots is preparing his people for an incoming invasion. A neighboring American alliance has been growing in popularity and it needs more turf to house its ever-expanding player base. The American leader has convinced the member of his alliance that this war is necessary and that the people they're invading are an evil enemy worth going to war to destroy. The leader of the defending Russian alliance gives the order for three dozen pilots to load up massive freighters with hundreds of ships and begin moving them to the starbase that will serve as the def defense headquarters near the front line. The Russian leader meets with his top fleet commanders and plots out the battle plan. Those fleet commanders, in turn, meet with hundreds of pilots to tell them what type of ship they should fly, be flying and what will be the, the strategy. On Saturday, in Chicago, the invasion has begun. The leader of the American alliance waited until a weekend night in the US time zones to ensure his pilots would have abundant real-life free time to participate. The Russians, on the other hand, are proving just as dedicated and have set their alarm clocks. It's 4 a.m. for them on their side of the globe, and to wake up early and meet the Americans head-on, they have set their alarms. Hundreds of pilots battle in the first starbase attack of the of the campaign. Massive laser blasts erupt from the doomsday cannons of Titan-class warships, and communications are buzzing with activity as each side's leaders bark orders and try to adapt their battle strategy on the fly. The control of the hundreds of star system is at stake, and the entire balance of power in the star cluster hangs in the balance. While on the other side of the star cluster, most players of EVE Online are oblivious to the violence of the invasion. A group of friends is wandering low security regions in the southeast of New Eden looking for pirates to rough up. A group of role players is hunting down members of the computer controlled Enger Cartel faction for the glory of the fictional Galante Empire. An explorer is scanning and documenting the 500 and 368 star system he has visited in his quest to document all 7,500 plus system of New Eden. A thief is worming his way into an enemy alliance, gaining the trust of his unsuspecting enemies so he can one day rob them for all their worth. A pilot maneuvers her sea ship into position alongside 200 allies and fires the opening volley of a battle that will last for six hours. An 
And every one of these players is a real person with their own personality, culture, and history. From around the world, they log into this complex and elaborate virtual space to try to make their way in this harsh vision of the future. Welcome to New Eden. This is Eve Online, a virtual universe set in the far future, in a cluster of stars called New Eden. It's a world of lasers and spaceships, of human beings making real sacrifice for the advancement of their organization. It was released to the public in 2003 and survives to this day as the only video game ever made where ambition, subterfuge, betrayal, and the unity of thousands of individuals are integral gameplay mechanics. It's a massively multiplayer online game, which is to say it's an online space where large numbers of players come together to play and explore the same game world. It's, a similar, it's similar to other MMOs, like World of Warcraft or EverQuest, but it's unique in very important ways. EVE has only two servers, one for the international community and one for Chinese players due to strict Chinese internet regulations. A server is a carbon copy of the game world. By contrast, most MMOs or virtual universes have dozens or hundreds of servers. In a typical online game, a player is, is assigned a server when they first start playing, and they can't interact with players from other servers. These servers are used so that there are never too many players online at once, which would make the world of a game like World of Warcraft too crowded. EVE Online can use a single server system to house hundreds of thousands of players from most of the world's nations because the game world is far larger than the average MMO. In most MMOs, you're, you're unlikely to see more than a hundred or so people in any given place. In EVE, the most popular star system are routinely filled with over a thousand players and the great battles they have made Eve famous <clears throat> and the great battle battles that have been that have made Eve famous have been waged by as many as 3000 players at once Eve is also unlike most games because it largely allows each player to decide what they'd like to do in the game when a new player logs into Eve online for the first time they're given a ship a small amount of money a tutorial they can follow if they want to, and some missions which give them a tour of some of the professions they can use to make money. But at any time, the player can fly off to any corner of the galaxy and do as they please. Many an adventurous player has set off on their first day for the more dangerous areas of the game to make their fortune. The majority of the players play on the server called Tranquility, over 23 hours a day. The server shuts down for daily maintenance from 11 to 11.30 GMT. Players log in from around the world and play together in the same space. The Chinese server is called Serenity and it has a much smaller community. The events described in this book chronicle the history of, tw of the Tranquility server from 2003 to 2009. The seeds that were laid in the earliest days of the game sparked a power struggle that has evolved throughout the years, culminating in the Great Eve War of 2007 and 2009. My name is Andrew Groen, not actually me, and I've spent the last 18 months conducting dozens of interviews and poring over source documents to write the first book collecting EVE Online's history. Much of this work involved fighting and speaking to the original players to reconstruct stories that were never written down. In other cases, fragmentary accounts have survived and been combined with interviews and recovered documents to resurrect stories that would have been lost to time. Like any sci-fi or fantasy game, 
there is a complex backstory behind the world of New Eden. According to the mythology written by EVE Online's developer, CCP Games, New Eden was discovered after a wormhole to a distant part of the galaxy opened near Old Earth, transporting settlers to a wondrous new place where they built colonies and new homes. But the prosperity did, didn't last. The wormhole suddenly closed, leaving millions of people stranded without adequate infrastructure to survive. One by one, these new colonies fell into a dark age, but a few of them survived and rebuilt their colonies. Over thousands of years, they rose again, developing distinct culture and mostly forgetting the whole world. This roughly is where the game begins. Eve takes place in the New Eden star cluster comprised of a, somewhere between seven to 8,000 star systems. And those original colonies have rebuilt and fashioned themselves into star-spanning empires. These, com these computer-controlled empires are known as Minmitar, Galante, Amar, and Kaldari. And they form what is called Empire Space. New players often choose to stay here because these systems are guarded by a computer-controlled police force which discourages players from fighting one another. The police force called Concord warps in almost instantly to punish any wrongdoers. Concord guard important location with nine vulnerable ships. However, Concord can only punish someone who commits a crime. It can't prevent the crime itself. The biggest threat to a player in EVE Online is always another player. While many pilots choose to make their living by mining or doing missions, others choose a life of piracy. They search New Eden for unwary travelers, easy prey. Even in the most highly secure areas of EVE, other players are still a potential threat. You can never truly be safe. The majority of EVE players spend their time in high security space, mining asteroids for money, investing in the commodities market and running missions. Most of the activity centers around trade hubs like Jita, where players con congregate to buy and sell goods and get missions from non-player characters. Missions in, Eve missions in EVE function much as they do in most other games. A player is given a task, usually to defeat some notorious fictional pirate. And if they are successful, then they gain some loot and cash reward. To help players get around from place to place, every star system in EVE is linked via a complex system of stargates. The only way to travel from one system to another is through these stargates. And each system may have one or several routes to other nearby systems. Concord's presence in any given system is rated on a scale from 1.0 to 0.0 with 1.0 being the most well protected. The security system serves as a sort of difficulty meter for players. In 1.0 or 0.9 space, you're very well protected and the chance of being attacked by other players is very low. But so are the rewards for playing there. The further a player gets from Empire Space, the more unforgiving Eve becomes. When you get far enough from Empire Space to reach Nullsec or 0.0, .0 space, there are, other, there are no restrictions of any kind on player behavior. In Nullsec, players can do, in de can do is seal off entire areas of space for their own private use, killing anybody who tries to, tries to enter. Whoever owns a star system makes the rule for that star system. EVE isn't designed to just look like a cold, dark and harsh world. It's designed to be a cold, dark and harsh world, wrote a community manager for EVE Online in one of the most enduring summaries of what defines the game. Players always need to be careful, because most of the games you work for in EVE can be destroyed forever. 
the world of Eve has complete has a complete economy of production and destruction. Almost everything in the game is built by the players, using materials they mined or otherwise produced. Some players are miners, and others build ships and advanced ship components, weapon arrays, shield boosters, etc. From the raw materials they produce. Everybody has their own way of making is interstellar credits, the main currency of New Eden, which is traded and spent just like any real currency. The ships that players produce fall into a few basic categories, frigates, cruisers, and battleships. There are many roles within those categories, but the hierarchy of cost and value progresses roughly from frigate to cruiser to battleship. Frigates being the least costly and battleships valued highest. Beyond those basic categories are the capital class ships. These didn't exist at the beginning of EVE Online. They are so expensive and complex to build that their construction generally requires the effort of hundreds of players. Capital ships and their bigger super capital siblings, Titans, will be explained in more detail later in the, in the book. The important thing to remember is that every ship has its own use. Even the smallest frigate is useful in the right situation. Every ship is highly customizable and can be fitted with an assortment of smaller components, from weapon emplacements to shield hardeners to speed boosters. Players don't have direct control over their ship, but they can give it commands. Go here, orbit this object at a distance of a thousand meters. Stop moving. Fire. These weapons. Fire these weapons. So when fighting in EVE, a player isn't dogfighting and aiming with a joystick. They are manipulating the control panel and giving orders to their ship. Cycling weapon system. Routing power. Activating repairs. Controlling drones. Winning a fight in EVE is more about knowing your ship's capabilities and simply having quick reflexes. When you die in most other games, you are resurrected. Usually with all of your items and gear. In EVE, a player who loses a fight faces the permanent loss of their spaceship and its cargo. Even if the player ejects in an escape pod and tries to get away, their pod can also be destroyed, which result in the permanent loss of the implants and cybernetic augmentation the player was using. Every player re resurrects as a clone of their former self when they die, but any possession they were carrying on board that ship which they may have worked weeks or months to earn, are lost. EVE Online has no quarter and is known as a sandbox game because the goal of the game is the players to define. For some, the goal is to make as much money as possible and become a powerful trade baron. For others, EVE is a game about spaceship combat. And these players spend their time improving their ships and looking for fights. Players looking for battle will head out from Empire Space into the low security areas looking for other willing to combatants. As they get farther and farther from Empire, the security rating decreases until eventually they arrive in 0.0. .0. This is where Eve really comes alive. Out in 0.0, .0 space, also called Nullsec, there is no law. The major nations of the game's lore have no footprint out here, and players are free to do as they please. Generally, that means two things, industry and conquest. In Nullsec, there are no penalties for destroying other players and no oversight of any kind. This means that players can form groups and wholly conquer the star system. In the early days of the game, this was somewhat informal. A group would set up shop in a system and declare that it was under their control. However, in 2004, the creators of EVE introduced a concept called sovereignty, 
which allow player groups to be officially recognized as the rulers of a star system or region. In an effort to control these regions of New Eden, players form corporation of hundreds of players who commit to working together. Some of those players are simple miners or logistic experts who serve their corporation by lining its wallet with ISK. Others serve as soldiers in the defense of territory and the invasion of enemy turf. Still others serve as governmental leaders devoted to keeping order and providing direction for the nation of players. Most players of EVE Online belong to a corporation of some sort. The majority of corporation are just small groups of friends working together, roaming New Eden looking for a fight or watching each other's back as they mine in the dangerous areas. What you can accomplish as an individual in EVE is nothing compared to what you can achieve with a group of reliable friends working together. Each corporation is unique in its mission structure and culture. When two corporations find they have goals in common, they can form an alliance, a feature of EVE that basically allows two or more corporations to share resources. They can share the same diplomatic standing list to make sure they don't accidentally shoot each other's allies. They can dock in each other's stations. Being in an alliance formalizes friendly relationships, making cooperation easier. In the outer reaches of New Eden, the player-led governments and armies of these alliances reign. Conquering territory requires the effort of many corporations working together. However, wherever there is power, there is also conflict. Many an organization has been torn apart, torn apart by infighting and civil war. Many re remarkable things happen in all areas of EVE Online, but this book will mainly focus on the clashes and the struggle for power between the diverse dedicated clans of 0.0, .0 space. These conflicts between player groups are unique events. While they take place as simulated video game battles, they are also a very real struggle for dominance and resources. Over time, warfare in EVE Online has grown more and more ruthless. When the game first launched, warfare was purely an in-game affair. Two small armies clashed on the battlefield and sometimes they were a clear winner. Over time, players turned to more elaborate tactics including psychological warfare. In the Neve War, there's more to a battle than spaceship and lasers. There's a real person piloting every ship, and their willingness to fight is perhaps the most important part of the war. Sometimes, Annihilance's war strategy involves destroying enemy infrastructure, or cutting off their ability to earn money to build ships. But sometimes, the strategy is to simply make the game so miserable for the enemy that their pilots stop showing up. To that end, propaganda has been a major factor in many EVE Online wars. Smart leaders know that, what, that they can shape the narrative of a war to make themselves look like underdogs, aggrieved parties, or even martyrs. In the era covered by this book, there was one online forum in particular where the majority of discussion about the game took place. A section of the EVE Online official forums called the Corporation, Alliance and Organization Discussion Forum. CAOD. This is where alliances came to make a case for war. Some leaders paid little attention to the discussions on CAOD, but others used it to disseminate to decimate their version of events to the rest of EVE. By crafting a compelling narrative, a leader could secure high-impact partner or convince other alliances to join the war on their side. Many an impassioned speech has been made on CAOD in an attempt to shame an enemy and rally support from the rest of the community. 
CAOD was the central place where the average EVE player could learn about the high drama taking place between warring alliances in Nullsec. However, the full story is never told on CAOD. The true story of Nullsec unfolds behind the scenes as players work out deals and agreements via the in-game chat program and out-of-the-game TeamSpeak style voice chat. Only a few hundred EVE players have ever reached the level of influence necessary to participate in the high-stakes gameplay of inter-alliance diplomacy. Every leader wants what is best for their alliance, but forming the wrong partnership or attacking the wrong enemy can lead to catastrophic failure. The stress of losing can, can fracture huge social groups, and deliberate psychological warfare can tear apart tear apart friendship and destroy trust. Over time, War and Eve has become more ferocious. In the older days of Eve, there was a concept called Ibushido, or e honor which argued that you should play Eve a certain way. Fighting should only take place between prepared parties within the game and anything outside the game was off-limits. Like Renaissance-era infantry, you are supposed to line up on the predetermined battlefield and exchange musket volleys like gentle folk. As in real combat, as in the real world, this fell out of favor. A huge part of winning a war in Modern Eve is about controlling information. Because behind every epic space battle there's a shadow war of informants, turncoats and spies. The more information you have, the more likely you are to win the spaceship fight. That means knowing in advance what the enemy force will be flying, and how best to combat their ships. It means placing scouts in, in outlying systems so you know when and where the enemy is coming, and whether they may have a reinforcement waiting nearby. It also means figuring out who the enemy's leaders are and making sure their ships are destroyed first to disrupt their lines of communication. It's also important to remember that while there are lasers and explosions in every battle, that isn't what the average pilot sees. For them, the battle is about following orders and falling in line. There are no lone wolf heroes in EVE, a fleet is a collaboration, and the side with more selfless pilots is usually victorious. The average player sees nothing more than a bunch of dots on the screen, their own ship's interface, and a chart listing nearby enemies and allies. It's almost impossible to understand what's happening in the battle when you're in the middle of it. That's the job of the fleet commander. The fleet commander is the guiding voice of the entire fleet giving direction to everyone and coordinating hundreds of people to form a coherent battle plan. To do that, the fleet commanders play an entirely different game than everyone else. They don't even look at the battle. Instead, they talk with as many people as possible. The lieutenants of the front lines, the scouts in neighboring system, their advisors, and so on. They try to peace <coughs> They try to piece everything together into an accurate picture of what's happening across multiple systems and possibly several large battles. There are hundreds of people waiting for them to give an order and they've all been trained to do exactly as the fleet commander says. These battles are generally fought over territory and in particular key systems that contain space stations where players can find missions and dock their ships. Mortary can mean unique types of gameplay to experience. It can also mean more opportunities for the Alliance to make money and more space where a growing Alliance can spread out. But even in a well-run Alliance, every combatant is human and has their own reasons for piloting their ship onto the battlefield. New Eden is a virtual universe ruled by real people. Chapter 3 Seeds of the Empires 
long before EVE Online hit store shelves, it had a community. From all over the world, gaming fans were lured in by the concept of a space-based, sci-fi, massively multiplayer game. An exception in a genre that had been dominated by the fantasy theme for a very long time. EVE Online seemed built for fans of older complex sci-fi games like Elite, Earth, and Beyond, and Homeworld, and many of the first EVE players were plucked directly from those three communities. When these disparate group arrived in New Eden during the private alpha and beta tests, they clashed immediately. The fight for dominance began before EVE Online had even been released to the public. Many of the most influential groups named themselves after the region in which they were headquartered. Stain Alliance, Curse Alliance, Fontaine Alliance and Vene Alliance were all named after important regions in Nullsec. But in EVE's Alpha and Beta tests, the group that would go on to have the biggest impact on early Eve was a homeworld clan that went by TAOSP, later renowned as the Conqueror's Evolution. This group of space tacticians would one day conquer nearly half of New Eden. But when they first arrived, there were a bunch of space strategy geeks playing an entirely different game. Lured in by the lofty promises of the sandbox EVE Online universe, the leaders of Evolution sent a letter to CCP Games telling the game makers about the types of things they wanted to do in this unique and open universe. They were invited to join EVE during its alpha stage alongside just a few hundred other players. At this point in EVE's development, there were only seven star systems, as compared to the over 7,000 systems that comprise the modern EVE universe. This was EVE at its most basic. But even in this shrunken state, Evolution's leader had a vision of things to come. The members of the community got to know each other very well, there, were, there weren't a lot of places to hide in just seven systems, after all. The biggest player corporation were no bigger than a couple dozen members. In this fetal stage of the game's development, a leader rose to the head of Evolution who defined its mission and public face for years to come. Everyone in the new Eden Star Cluster would one day know... would one day know the name of Sir Moly pronounced Sir Mole. Even to his enemies, who often later became his strongest allies, Sir Mole was one of the greatest leaders in the history of EVE Online. He was arrogant, inspiring, and prideful to a fault. Sir Mole was a forceful statesman and was one of the best EVE players ever when, when it came down to bending other players, players to his will. Sarmole cast himself as a ruthless space tyrant, not exactly the bad guy, but a leader with just the right balance of control and crazy. Like other powerful leaders throughout Eve's history, he'd even butt heads with the game's developers. He projected an image of the strong dictator his enemies wished they could be. <coughs> In him, they saw someone whose rule was absolute. In stark contrast to the messiness of their own political affairs, this was fiction, of course. Sir Mole was backed up by a team of talented logisticians and strategists, but they all understood the need for someone like Sir Mole. They knew there was a strategic advantage in appearing to be in lockstep behind a singular face. The chiseled sneer of Sir Mole's avatar. After having spent countless hours talking with the, with the man during the reporting of this book, I think he began to buy into his own personal at times. Despite the modesty which he lived his offline life, 
In real life, Sormoli was a repairman who immigrated to Denmark from Sweden. He fixed air conditioners by day, and by night he commanded the most feared fleets in New Eden. Sormoli's corporation, Evolution, had been with Eve since the beginning, save for one brief incident where Sormole was expelled from the Alpha stage testing for calling for the resignation of one of Eve's lead designer. He called the designer out for gross incompetence and was met with a ban. The ban didn't stick and Sormole was backed in action when the beta launched. But it wouldn't be the only time he was banned from the game. As Alpha ended and beta launched, the game's developers mingled freely with the players, and they were considered extremely high-value targets. Every player wanted to stick a missile in the hole of a developer, and they were good at it, Sarmoli told me. They wanted us to shoot them and have fun. Sarmoli and a friend once came across a developer ship undocking from a station. Sarmoli and his compatriot instantly turned their guns on the ship and unloaded every bit of ammunition they had at their disposal, laughing all the while. So we're unloading on this battleship, reloading, unloading, reloading, unloading, and he's not firing back. He's behaving oddly. <coughs> all of a sudden, the server goes down. Their screen, their screen went black and the tiny whole side, one-sided battle ended. This alone didn't raise their suspicions. Server shutdowns were very common during beta and CCP were constantly wiping and resetting the servers. But when the game came online again, they receive a message. You are banned. They, they immediately log into the RSC channel, an online chat program, where the game's developers could often be found, and ask them what the deal was. The reply came back. Yeah, sorry about that, we're doing a press showing and you just shot down the journalist. One of the first reporters ever to play Eve, undocked from the station, and before they could even figure out how to pilot the ship, the denizens of Eve had ambushed them. Sarmoli told this with a giggle on his, in his voice, still clearly proud 12 years later to have caused such a mischief. Throughout his EVE career, Mischief has followed him wherever he goes. Though his space tyrant persona carried an air of righteous justice, Sarmoli really loved starting trouble. EVE's beta was the wound for more than just the game's development. It was a time when the power structure of the community was beginning to form. Every major power in New Eden, for the first few years of the game's retail release, had a pass in the beta. There's an obvious advantage to starting the game long before everyone else, but there are some not so obvious ones, too. Certainly, these players were more experienced in the ways of production and combat, but the more critical aspects were networking and training. Players who had been around longer simply had more friends, and you can't overstate the importance of allies when it comes to succeeding in cutthroat New Eden. Evolutions and, ev and every corporation with the privilege of beginning the beta had one more advantage. Throughout the beta, CCP wiped the servers dozens of times and everyone had to start back at square one every time it happened. Ostensibly, this would reset Evolution's advantages, but it actually helped the fledgling organization. By the time the game launched, Evolution's leader had rebuilt the corporation from the ground up dozen of times. They knew exactly how to structure themselves, they knew how to get rich quickly, they knew how to build a fleet and fight battles. If you took the general population and compared them to us, we were miles ahead, Sir Molly told me, perhaps arrogantly. We used Alpha and Beta to plan, to build networks, to get to know people, and on the last day of Beta, 
we killed the corporation completely started from scratch and said we'll keep these people these pe other people we do not want and it was true to its namesake evolution the darwinian theme would permeate their language and messaging for years to come but even as it's reformed other groups were forced forming at the same time who had the same grand ambition as Sarmoli and his people the venal alliance most most of the powerful corporation of early eve online game came from other video games but venal alliance was different its core constituents weren't video gamers they were larpers live action role players all over the world larp groups do real world mock battle with swords and wizardry but this english larp group was special with thousands of players it was so large that politics became a very important part of the game when eve online launched a small group of 30 or so players from this larp club decided to try it out and they brought their predilection for politics and role-playing with them. They called themselves the Jericho Fraction. Their leader was a male player who played the female character Jade Constantine, and he was heavily influenced by his experience in medieval alliance of LARPers. He was also a student of Middle English literature. In our interview, he often made references to Arthurian legend. The players in Jericho Fraction were originally looking for a sci-fi alternative to their usual medieval gaming, and they were struck by the lore of EVE Online. They found inspiration in the fact that EVE players are able to resurrect whenever they die in combat. They formed roleplay personas around the idea that the cloning technology that made this possible is a truly transformational technology. They believe that this technology made the individual human so powerful that there was no need for a governmental structure and that we could effectively take care of ourselves. This ethos was crystallized on the second day of Eve's retail release. The first member of Jericho Fraction to join Eve happened upon a small slave operation. A half dozen players were forcing another group of players to do their mining, under the threat of destroying their ships. All the while, the slavers spouted off about how the miners were lazy or not paying enough of a kickback. Many players of Eve Online enjoy pretending to, actual, to be actual denizens of New Eden and they are not now adamant about playing in character. It's not too surprising some players would be willing to pretend they were enslaved just to further their roleplay persona. It's likely they were just putting on a roleplay show, but it sparked the individualist, freedom-loving ideals of Jade Constantine and the Jericho Fraction. The members of Jericho Fraction were traders and merchants. Back in the earliest days of EVE, one of the best ways to make money was by buying and selling commodities in different markets across the game. Later, EVE would place all of its emphasis on the player-controlled market, but the, in the early days, players could buy items and wares from characters and stations all over the game and then sell them elsewhere, so a trader could for instance, make a profit by buying a commodity in Western Galante space, then selling it in Eastern Minmatar space, where it was more scarce. In addition to their LARPers, Jericho Fraction also had among them a set of dedicated and intelligent board game enthusiasts, who were adept at picking apart an economic system and finding the best way to game it. They quickly puzzled out the optimum way to make money from this commodity trading system and Jericho Fraction became extremely wealthy. Their secrets didn't last though. Other traders eventually discovered their methods and would challenge them on their trade routes. 
the traders of the Jericho Fraction Corporation knew that you could buy robotics, a commodity in the north of New Eden, then sell them in the south for a profit of millions of isk, an absurd amount of money at the time. The trick was that the commodity price was flexible. Once a player flooded the market by selling all their robotic goods, the price would start to fall. The prices reset every day when the New Eden server went down for maintenance. What resulted was a daily series of early morning races along the most profitable trade routes. Merchants would log in as quickly as possible after the server came back online from the daily maintenance shutdown and fly down the trade routes to the most profitable destination. But the merchants weren't the only ones who figured out these routes. These well-traveled merchant racetracks drew a bevy of pirate traps looking for easy prey. Some of these pirates were mercenaries hired by the traders who used that path. They'd pay the pirates to shoot down their competition in order to give them an easier path to profit. Before long, Jericho Fraction realized there was even more money to be found in the uncharted territories of Nullsec. The goods that could be purchased up in the Venal region could be sold for as much as 20 to 30 million isk per run. This was in an, in an era of New Eden where even 1 million isk was a fortune to the average player. Jericho Fraction identified the region of Venal as having particularly good profit margin and set course for Nullsec for the first time. The only trouble was that Nullsec was exceedingly dangerous and a group of pirate corporations already had control over Venal. It wouldn't be right to call them sovereigns, but it was the most powerful group in the region. The corporation called themselves the Venal Alliance and were most interested in acting as highwaymen. The Alliance made a modest living by waiting outside stargates and attacking random passerby. The Venal Alliance pirates were a problem for Jericho Fraction. It posed a serious risk to the transport ships they were moving commodities. And so the leader of Jericho Fraction, Jade Constantine, made contact with the leader of these pirates and set up a meeting with the heads of their corporations. They got together to talk and Jan Co Jade Constantine gave them her sales, speech, sales pitch and a warning. She began with a description of Jericho Fraction money-making endeavors. Jade showed these pirates how much a thoughtful organization was capable of earning in EVE, which also served the ulterior purpose of making the pirates feel small time. But Jade also argued that their time was ending. Large alliances were on the rise in New Eden wealthy fountain alliance in the west, forsaken empire in the east, stain alliance in the southwest and the warlike curse alliance in the southeast it was only a matter of time until these entities sought to claim the uncharted north. <coughs> Jade convinced the pirate that they needed a financial backbone in order to survive against more experienced foes. The pirates agreed to form an alliance with Jericho Fraction. Instead of hunting the traitors, the pirate fractions were now their bodyguard, providing safe passage for merchant ships to make their profits. Venal Alliance now had a military and a financial backbone. But it wasn't until Tagar Transdimensional came to the north that it became a complete alliance. The Guard Transdimensional was an industrial powerhouse in the early days of EVE, making a small fortune as a union of expert miners and shipbuilders. 
Its success attracted new members, and it grew into out of the out of the original superpowers of New Eden. The only trouble was that material were scarce in the early New Eden. Targar Transdimensional could sell the materials it mined for a large profit, but its mining operation couldn't source all of the materials it needed to build its battleship fleets. So Targar had a choice. Waste all its profits buying materials from other corporations or find some place where it could mine everything itself. The mineral it needed was called Crocite, and the region of Venal happened to be an extremely rich source of it. Tagart approached the Venal Alliance to become a member, and discovered the Alliance was a perfect fit. Tagart would be do the mining work, which few people in Venal Alliance were interested in, and it also brought an impressive dozen strong battleship fleet that rivaled any other power in New Eden. What began as a simple conglomeration of pirate factions had grown into an alliance with a well-stocked military, a merchant fleet, a mining division, and even Eve's most renowned public relations specialist, Jay Constantine who would use press releases and propaganda to turn Venal Alliance into the most visible group in the game. Now this was it for this week. We'll have the sweet another time.